Hello everyone. Welcome to this session on osteology of the lower limb. In this session, we'll be revising all the bones of the lower limb. Okay. So here we can see the bones of the lower limb. In this, we are viewing the bones from the anterior aspect. In this image, we are viewing the bones from the posterior aspect. Okay. So let us just list down all the bones of the lower limb. This bone is the hip bone, and this bone is femur. And there's a small bone here that is patella. Then in the leg there are two bones. The medial bone is tibia. The lateral bone is fibula. Okay. Then in the foot there are tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. Okay. So in this session uh, we'll be covering each of the bones in these headings. Okay. These are standard headings in which any bone is described. So let's start with the hip bone first. So these are the headings in which we'll be learning about the hip bone. So let's start with the first heading that is the type of hip bone. Here we can see the irregular shape of the hip bone. That's why it is an example of a irregular bone. Okay. Then coming to side determination of hip bone. For side determination, uh, we always have to determine side by justifying three dimensions. Okay. What are those three dimensions? We should say one point covering superior and inferior, one point covering anterior and posterior, and one point covering medial and lateral okay so for hip bone for superior and inferior we can say the upper expanded part that is the ilium is on the superior aspect okay then for anterior and posterior here we can say the articulated pelvis on the anterior aspect there is a bony projection that is referred to as the anterior superior iliac spine that should be on the anterior aspect okay and for medial and lateral we can say this this is the acetabulum of the hip bone Okay, acetabulum should be facing on the lateral aspect. Okay, so if we justify these three dimensions, we can easily determine the side of the hip bone. Okay, and while holding the hip bone, we have to hold it near this greater sciatic notch, such that the space between the thumb and the index finger is held here. Okay, and uh, while holding, we should uh, take care that this anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle they lie in one. coronal plane okay this is important for anatomical position of the hip bone so in this this hip bone is of the right side we are viewing it from the lateral aspect and coming to the parts of the hip bone so three basic parts are there one is the ilium and this is the ischium and this is pubis okay the so three parts are divided by a triradiate cartilage which is present here near the acetabulum we can extend the triradiate cartilage such that entire subdivision can be seen okay so the largest part is ilium then there is ischium and smallest part is the pubis so just knowing these parts is not enough we should know further subdivisions of these parts as well in ilium we should know its borders and surfaces as well here we can see this is the anterior border of the ilium then here this is the posterior border of ilium and the superior border is also referred to as the iliac crest okay then there is a border here on the medial aspect that is medial border okay then coming to the surfaces of the ilium this surface which we can see this is the iliac fossa also called as the iliac surface then this surface on the lateral aspect this is the gluteal surface okay then the part which articulates with the sacrum and there is a part uh, in the lower aspect as well this entire area is referred to as the sacro pelvic surface okay so these are the various surfaces of the ilium and uh, there are certain bony projections which we should know this this is the anterior superior iliac spine this is the anterior inferior iliac spine similarly on the posterior aspect there is posterior superior iliac spine and posterior inferior iliac spine okay and there is a projection on the iliac crest just 5 cm behind the anterior uh, superior iliac spine there is an elevation which is referred to as the tubercle of the iliac crest so this was about ilium then in ischium th there is one this characteristic feature that is referred to as the ischial spine then this is ischial tuberosity which has got further characteristic parts uh, i'll cover that when i cover the attachments of the ischium then this part is referred to as the ischio pubic ramus connecting the ischium and the pubis this is the 
ischiopubic ramus and this is the pubis okay pubis is seen clearly here the pubis articulates with the pubis of the opposite side in the midline this is a secondary cartilaginous joint also called as symphysis in the pubis uh, there is a line here that is referred to as the pectineal line okay and coming to various attachments of the hip bone let's start with the attachments of the ilium this projection is the anterior superior iliac spine this gives attachment to a muscle that is sartorius muscle also there is one ligament which is attached here name of the ligament is inguinal ligament okay so inguinal ligament and sartorius these two structures are attached on the anterior superior iliac spine and two structures are attached on to the anterior inferior iliac spine as well there is the straight head of rectus femoris muscle and the iliofemoral ligament okay iliofemoral ligament also called as ligament of biglow one characteristic feature uh, which we should know note here is in the anterior superior iliac spine the ligament is on the superior aspect and the muscle is on the inferior aspect but is reverse in the anterior inferior iliac spine okay here the muscle is on the superior aspect ligament is on the inferior aspect there is one tricky question which examiners could ask in the exam okay then there are various attachments on the iliac crest so for attachments of the iliac crest i have kept this image so if you see the iliac crest it has got uh, three parts an outer lip an intermediate area and an inner lip okay in the anterior three fourth segment here we can see the three muscles of the abdomen we see in this region from outer to in the side there will be external oblique internal oblique and transversus abdominis will be on the inner aspect then on the posterior aspect here in front of this dorsal segment there are two muscles which are attached on the outer aspect there is latissimus dorsi and on the inner aspect there is quadratus lumborum muscle okay and in the dorsal segment of the iliac crest this is the dorsal segment of the iliac crest it has got an outer sloping surface and an inner sloping surface okay outer sloping surface gives attachment to the gluteus maximus muscle the inner sloping surface gives attachment to the erector spinae muscle okay so this was uh, attachments of the iliac crest then attachments of the gluteal surface if you see in the gluteal surface there are three lines which are referred to as gluteal lines all these lines arise from this edge of the greater sciatic notch this line which goes here up to the anterior inferior iliac spine this is the inferior gluteal line there is a line which goes up to this iliac tubercle okay tubercle of the iliac crest this is anterior gluteal line a line goes here at the junction of this ventral and the dorsal segments this line is the posterior gluteal line okay so these are the three gluteal lines i'll repeat again posterior gluteal line anterior gluteal line and inferior gluteal line okay with respect to this gluteal lines there are attachments behind the posterior gluteal line the muscle attached is gluteus maximus then between posterior and anterior gluteal line the muscle is gluteus medius in between anterior and inferior gluteal line the muscle is gluteus minimus and below the inferior gluteal line there is the reflected head of the rectus femoris muscle okay straight head was arising from the anterior inferior iliac spine the reflected head arises from the area just below this inferior gluteal line okay so there are various attachments on the gluteal surface then attachment on the iliac fossa is iliacus muscle then there are some attachments here near the ischial spine this notch is referred to as the lesser sciatic notch in the upper part of lesser sciatic notch there is a superior gammalis and in the lower part there is inferior gammalis okay so two gammalis are attached here then this is the ischial tuberosity this ischial tuberosity can be divided into areas there is an upper quadrangular area and a lower triangular area okay So can you appreciate a quadrangle in the upper part and triangle in the lower part? Okay, upper quadrangular part is divided into a lateral part and a medial part. Okay, lateral part gives attachment to a muscle that is semi-membranous muscle, and medial part gives attachment to two muscles, semi-tendinous and the biceps femoris. The long head of the biceps femoris is attached here. Okay, 
and the lower triangular part is again further subdivided into lateral and the medial parts the lateral part gives attachment to the adductor magnus muscle and the medial part is subcutaneous okay so fibro fatty tissue is there and this area this is the pubis on the outer aspect of the pubis the adductor muscles are attached so adductor longus brevis magnus is attached on the ischiopubic ramus as well and on the ischial tuberosity as well then on the lateral aspect of this ischial tuberosity also there is a muscle that is quadratus femoris muscle okay so if you remember at least it is difficult to remember all but you can try to remember at least major muscles which are attached on to the hip bone okay logically if you remember it will be easy the adductor muscles are attached here the hamstring muscles are attached here the gluteal muscles are attached on to the gluteal surface so that's how logically you can remember the muscle attachments of hip bone and then joints formed by the hip bone this acetabulum it articulates with the head of the femur this is a ball and socket variety of synovial joint then there is a joint here between the sacrum and the hip bone this is the sacroiliac joint it is a plain variety of synovial joint then in the midline there is a joint this is symphysis okay there are various joints and coming to applied anatomy of the hip bone this highest point of the iliac crest it lies between l3 and l4 and that helps in lumbar puncture okay the space in between l3 and l4 is used for lumbar puncture and to identify that the highest point of the iliac crest is important okay and uh, the hip bone and pelvis together they have great value in sex determination in 4 and 6 also hip bone may get fractured because of its irregular shape fractures of the hip bones are also common okay so this was all about the hip bone now let's move on to the next bone that is femur now let's study about the femur bone here we can see the right femur viewed from the anterior aspect in this image the right femur is viewed from the posterior aspect okay so femur also will be covering under under all these headings femur is which type of bone it is an example of a typical long bone okay a typical long bone has got two ends and an intervening shaft in between then side determination of the femur again by three dimensions for superior and inferior we can say the head is on the superior aspect for medial and lateral also we can say the head is facing on the medial aspect okay so with the head itself we can say two points one is head is superior and head is facing on the medial aspect okay and for anterior and posterior this point is very important this is the intercondylar fossa in between the two condyles the space which we can see this is the intercondylar fossa this is on the posterior aspect so if we justify by the by these three points we can easily determine the side of the femur then coming to various parts of the femur femur is an example of a typical long bone so it has got three characteristic parts this is the upper end shaft and the lower end further subdivisions of the upper end we should be knowing upper end has got the head of the femur this is the neck of the femur then there are two uh, projections which are referred to as greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter okay this is the greater trochanter this is the lesser trochanter and in between the two trochanters on the anterior aspect there is intertrochanteric line and on the posterior aspect there is intertrochanteric crest okay and intertrochanteric crest has got an elevation which is referred to as quadrate tubercle and on the inner aspect of the greater trochanter there is a depression which is referred to as trochanteric fossa okay it's not seen clearly here but in actual femur you will be seeing a depression on the inner aspect of the greater trochanter that is trochanteric fossa so these are the basic parts in the upper end of the femur and coming to the shaft of the femur shaft has got three borders and three surfaces but the medial border and the lateral border are not well defined it is almost circular only one characteristic border is seen on the posterior aspect that is referred to as linea aspera if we trace the linea aspera on the upper aspect and lower aspect we can see it splits up in the upper part it splits up in the lower part so when it splits in the upper part on the lateral aspect there is a rough elevation which is referred to as 
gluteal tuberosity and splitting on the medial aspect there is a line which is referred to as spiral line okay so on the medial aspect there is spiral line on the lateral aspect there is gluteal tuberosity and on the lower aspect this splitting encloses an area here this is the popliteal surface of the femur okay so these must things uh, we should be knowing about the shaft of the femur and coming to the lower end of the femur lower end has got two condyles this is the medial condyle this is the lateral condyle and on the posterior aspect in between the two condyles there is a space that is referred to as intercondylar fossa also referred to as intercondylar notch then just like in humerus uh, there were supracondylar lines femur also has got supracondylar line this is the medial supracondylar line and this is the lateral supracondylar line okay and there are projections on the condyles which is referred to as epicondyles okay so the most projecting part of the medial condyle will be referred to as medial epicondyle similarly on the lateral aspect the most projecting part on the lateral aspect will be referred to as lateral epicondyle remember the difference between condyles and epicondyles condyles are articular and epicondyles are non articular okay then uh, on the medial aspect there is one uh, important feature here just in the lower part of this medial supracondylar line there is an elevation which is referred to as the adductor tubercle okay so here are the various parts of the femur let's cover the attachments of the femur let's start with the attachments of this trochanter this lesser trochanter gives attachment to two muscles one is sos major and other is iliacus okay two muscles attached on to the lesser trochanter are sos major and iliacus then greater trochanter the tip of the greater trochanter gives attachment to a muscle that is and there is a ridge on the anterior aspect of greater trochanter it gives attachment to gluteus minimus and a ridge on the lateral aspect of greater trochanter gives attachment to gluteus medius okay so gluteus minimus and medius on the greater trochanter gluteus maximus is on the gluteal tuberosity Okay, only one fourth part is inserted onto the gluteal tuberosity. Maximum part three fourth is inserted onto the iliotibial tract. Then uh, trochanteric fossa. It gives attachment to the tendon of obturator externus. And just in front of the trochanteric fossa, there is uh, attachment of obturator internus with two gamelae. Okay, so all obturator externus, internus, two gamelae, all are attached onto the inner aspect of the greater trochanter then in the head of the femur there is the attachment of the ligament that is referred to as ligamentum teres femoris okay in the intertrochanteric line there is a ligament that is the capsular ligament of the hip hip joint then near the intertrochanteric line upper aspect gives attachment to a muscle vastus lateralis and lower aspect gives attachment to a muscle vastus medialis and the anterior aspect of the shaft of the femur most of it is covered by a muscle that is vastus intermedius okay and there are few slips of attachments of muscle uh, on the lower part that is articularis genu muscle then there are many attachments on this linea aspera it can be remembered by a mnemonic this is the mnemonic and what is the mnemonic uh, you can ask me in the whatsapp group it cannot be uh, spoken out in public okay so so i stands for the vastus intermedius l stands for vastus lateralis b stands for the biceps femoris muscle then n stands for adductor magnus and again this b is for adductor brevis this l is for adductor longus And M is for vastus medialis. Okay, this mnemonic is from lateral to medial. Various attachments on the linea aspera. For adductor magnus muscle, there are two heads of origin. The axial head is a part of hamstring that will go up to the adductor tubercle, whereas the adductor part is attached onto the linea aspera. Then the supracondylar lines, the medial supracondylar line will give attachment to the medial head of the gastrocnemius and 
the lateral supracondylar line in the lower aspect gives the attachment to the lateral head of gastrocnemius along with the muscle that is plantaris muscle and on the lateral aspect there is an attachment of tendon of popliteus muscle so these are the various attachments of the femur let's see the joints formed by the femur joint formed by the head of the femur we already covered in hip bone that is the ball and socket variety of synovial joint then joint between the femur and the patella it is a saddle variety of synovial joint then joint between the femur and the tibial condyles it's a bicondylar modified hinge variety of synovial joint okay then various applied anatomy with respect to the femur the neck of the femur uh, is the most common site of fracture of the femur and there are various types of the fracture neck of femur that is intracapsular extracapsular whenever there is intracapsular fracture it usually hampers the retinacular vessels which supply the head of the femur and it leads to clinical condition which is called as avascular necrosis of the femur okay then femur even though being the longest and the strongest bone uh, it may get fractured and if it gets fractured at least to a clinical condition which, which is referred to as fat embolism okay then in the lower end of the femur there are applied anatomy with respect to the knee joint osteoarthritis and all so this was all about the femur let's move on to the next bone which is patella so patella is a sesamoid bone which develops under the tendon of quadriceps femoris muscle okay what do we mean by quadriceps femoris combination of four muscles vastus medialis vastus intermedius vastus lateralis and rectus femoris okay so this is the right patella viewed from the anterior aspect in this we are viewing the patella from the posterior aspect type of bone it is a sesamoid bone because it develops under the tendon of a muscle for side determination again by three dimensions for superior and inferior we can say the upper part is broad the lower part is narrow for anterior and posterior we can say the anterior part is rough okay and the posterior part is smooth and for medial and lateral this surface we can see the this smooth surface divided into two parts a larger lateral surface and a smaller medial surface okay this large surface should be on the lateral side that's how we can determine the side of the patella most important for determination of the side of patella okay and the posterior surface has got subdivisions in the upper 3/4 part and the lower 1/4 part the lower 1/4 part gives attachment to the ligament that is referred to as ligamentum patellae then muscle attachments of patella are important so since this is the right patella viewed from the anterior aspect this is the medial part in the medial part there is a muscle here that is vastus medialis okay vastus lateralis gets attached on, only on to the upper part and this base this area gives attachment to two muscles on the anterior part there will be rectus femoris and on the posterior part there will be vastus intermedius this attachment on the medial aspect of the patella is important because patella has a tendency for lateral displacement so this vastus medialis keeps the patella intact in position okay joints uh, we have covered in femur that is the saddle variety of synovial joint then applied anatomy with respect to the patella patella since it is a sesamoid bone it lacks periosteum so fractures of the patella are difficult to heal now let's move on to the next bone now let's start with the bones of the leg in the leg there are two bones the medial bone is tibia and the lateral bone is fibula okay so to understand the borders and surfaces the cross section of tibia and fibula are important here we can see the cross section viewed from the inferior aspect the medial bone this is tibia and this is fibula in borders and surfaces of the fibula this made understanding of this medial crest is important okay once we understand the medial crest then the borders and surfaces of the fibula will be easy this is the interosseous membrane which is attached in between the two bones interosseous membrane gets attached on to the medial border sorry for fibula it is the medial border for tibia it is the lateral border okay let's see both the bones in details so in this image we can see the tibia the right tibia viewed from the anterior aspect is the right tibia viewed from the posterior aspect and this is the upper end of the right tibia viewed from the superior aspect okay 
So CBI is which type of bone? It is an example of a typical long bone having three characteristic parts: upper end, shaft, and the lower end. Then for side determination, so what three points which we can say? For superior and inferior, we can say the condyles of the tibia are on the superior aspect. For anterior and posterior, we can say this this is the tibial tuberosity, which is on the anterior aspect. And for medial and lateral, this is the best point. This is the medial malleolus, which should be facing on the medial aspect. Okay, so if we justify by these three dimensions, we can easily determine the side of the tibia. Then various parts of the tibia, various parts of the upper end. We see the two condyles. This is the medial condyle. This is the lateral condyle. In between the two condyles, this area is referred to as the intercondylar area, and there is an elevation here which is referred to as the intercondylar eminence. Okay. Then on the anterior aspect, this is tibial tuberosity. On the medial condyle, posteriorly there is a groove here. There is a groove for a muscle which is referred to as semimembranosus. Then lateral condyle has got a flat surface here for articulation of the head of the fibula. Okay. Lateral condyle has got also a facet on the anterior aspect for attachment of the iliotibial tract. These are various features in the upper end of the tibia. And coming to the shaft of the tibia, shaft has got three borders and three surfaces. This anterior border of the tibia is important. This is referred to as the Shin of the tibia, it is subcutaneous throughout, and also the medial surface of the tibia is subcutaneous. Okay, so since since much of the area is subcutaneous, there are very few muscle attachments on the tibia as compared to that of the fibula. Then along the lateral aspect, the surface is lateral surface, which gives the attachment to a muscle that is tibialis anterior muscle. And here we can see an oblique line here. This is the soleal line. This is the attachment to the soleus muscle. This is soleal line. In this opening, which we can see, this is the nutrient foramen. Okay, nutrient foramen for tibia is the largest amongst all bones of the body. Coming to the lower end of the tibia, this is the characteristic feature in lower end. That is the medial malleolus. Then there is inferior articular surface of the tibia, which will articulate with the talus. Then various attachments of the tibia. This tibial tuberosity gives attachment to a muscle that is. It actually gives attachment to the ligament that is referred to as the ligamentum patellae. The quadriceps femoris, its primary insertion becomes the patella, and from there there is a ligament which extends down towards the tibia that is ligamentum patellae. Then one muscle we covered here that is the semimembranosus groove behind the medial condyle. Then the multiple attachments in this intercondylar area it can be remembered by mnemonic. Medical College Lucknow on the anterior part of the intercondylar area and on the posterior part of intercondylar area again Lucknow Medical College. Okay, where M stands for the medial meniscus. C stands for the cruciate ligament. On the anterior aspect, there will be anterior cruciate ligament. L stands for the lateral meniscus. So here it will be the anterior end of medial meniscus, anterior end of lateral meniscus. Similarly, here there will be posterior end of lateral meniscus, posterior end of medial meniscus. And here C stands for the posterior cruciate ligament. Okay. So all these attachments are in the intermediate area then attachments in the shaft one muscle which we covered was on the lateral aspect there is tibialis anterior muscle and muscles on the posterior aspect above the soleal line the muscle is popliteus then in the soleal line the muscle is soleus muscle and in the posterior surface there are two muscles which we need to remember on the lateral aspect there is tibialis posterior and on the medial aspect there is flexor digitorum longus okay tibialis posterior is on the lateral aspect how we can remember this because this muscle has got has got attachment on the tibia also the interosseous membrane and also on the fibula okay that's how we can remember that tibialis posterior is on the lateral aspect and on the medial aspect there is flexor digitorum longus 
and for remembering this also there is a trick digits are on the lateral aspect but the muscle is arising from the medial bone okay so there is a little crossing over which occurs so this cross you can remember to remember the muscle which is attached on the bone flexor digitorum longus is on tibia flexor hallucis longus will be on fibula okay so there are various muscles attached here in the lower part there is no muscle attached it is there are various relations in the lower part which will be learning in the relations of the ankle joint okay and then coming to the joints formed by the tibia the upper end it forms the knee joint then on the lateral aspect there are three joints how three joints the fibula it has got a superior tibio fibular joint middle tibio fibular joint and the uh, inferior tibio fibular joint okay superior tibio fibular joint is a plain variety of synovial joint middle tibio fibular joint is a syndesmosis also the inferior tibio fibular joint is also a syndesmosis okay then joint between the tibia and the talus the joint is ankle joint it is a hinge variety of synovial joint then applied anatomy with respect to tibia tibia is a common site for osteomyelitis okay upper end of the tibia is usually involved in a clinical condition which is called as osteomyelitis as we know that uh, there are very few muscles attached onto the tibia so whenever there is fracture of the lower end of the tibia it there is delayed union which occurs okay fracture in the upper end can heal soon because the nutrient artery is towards the upper part so there is an applied anatomy which we need to know now let's see the fibula bone fibula students consider it as uh, one of the most difficult bones of the lower limb but it is not that difficult once you understand about this medial crest the various borders and surfaces of the fibula will be clear and uh, it will be easy to identify the various surfaces okay so for type of fibula it is an example of a typical long bone so it has got an upper end shaft and the lower end for side determination we can see the head of the fibula is on the superior aspect but at times the upper end and the lower end look similar or at times this head of the fibula is damaged so it becomes difficult to identify which part is superior and which part is inferior so for that we can identify this region this is the malleolar fossa okay by the malleolar fossa we can cover all the three dimensions of fibula okay how malleolar fossa is on the inferior aspect malleolar fossa is on the posterior aspect if you see this is the malleolar fossa this is the anterior aspect this is posterior aspect okay and malleolar fossa is facing medially so with the malleolar fossa we can cover all the three dimensions then in parts the head of, head gives a projection is referred to as the styloid process of the fibula then shaft has got various borders and surfaces this cross section is to add, uh, identify the various borders and surfaces there is the anterior border there is the posterior border and there is the medial border which gives attachment to the interosseous membrane okay see this medial crest this adds to the confusion in borders and surfaces okay so once we have identified the these three borders this posterior surface which we can see this has to be divided by the medial crest okay medial crest divides the posterior surface into two parts the first border which we can try to identify is the anterior border and trace it medially the first border which when we trace medially that is the medial border okay and from the anterior border trace laterally the border is posterior border once you have identified the three borders the one part which is remaining is the medial crest of the fibula okay that's how borders and surfaces of the fibula will be clear and in the lower end this entire thing is referred to as the lateral malleolus and there is a depression here that is referred to as malleolar fossa and coming to various attachments of the fibula attachment of the upper end here there is a muscle which is attached that is the biceps femoris muscle okay also the fibular collateral ligament is attached here for attachments of the shaft of the fibula there is a different slide we'll cover in that then various joints formed by the fibula 
superior tibiofibular joint is a plain variety of synovial joint the middle tibiofibular joint is syndesmosis the inferior tibiofibular joint is also syndesmosis also fibula takes part in the articulation of the ankle joint okay so tibia fibula and talus these three bones together form the ankle joint in applied anatomy with respect to the fibula fibula is one of the bone which violates the law of ossification okay what is law of ossification it says that the epiphysis which appears first is the last to fuse with the shaft but for the lower end of the fibula the epiphysis appears first and also it fuses first with the shaft okay why it happens because the lower end of the fibula is a pressure epiphysis for weight bearing it fuses first why the epiphysis of the upper end fuses last because this upper end is the growing end of the, of the fibula as we can see here there is a needle which is inserted in the nutrient foramen nutrient foramen is directed downwards that means the upper end is the growing end of the fibula that's why it fuses last with the shaft okay now let's see various muscle attachments of the fibula to understand the muscle attachment schematic diagram is very important because it is very difficult to point out the surfaces in the actual bone so here we can see the schematic diagram of the medial surface in the medial surface maximum attachment is of the extensor digitorum longus okay you can remember extensor digitorum has got extensive attachment it has got attachment on the upper 1/4 as well as anterior half of the middle 2/4 is extensor digitorum longus okay posterior half of the middle 2/4 is extensor hallucis longus and the lower 1/4 part of the muscle is fibularis tertius okay it's written peroneus peroneus is an old name fibularis is the new name okay and on the lateral aspect there are two muscles fibularis longus and fibularis brevis fibularis longus is on the upper aspect as well as the posterior half of the middle aspect the anterior half of the middle part and the lower end entirely is the fibularis brevis muscle the attachments on the posterior surface in the upper part there is small attachment of soleus soleus has got majority of attachment on tibia some attachment is on fibula then tbl is posterior tbl is posterior will be on the medial aspect or lateral aspect should be on the medial aspect because the tibia bone is on the medial aspect this muscle has attachment on the interosseous membrane as well as on the tibia as well okay then on the lateral aspect there is flexor hallucis longus flexor digitorum longus is on tibia flexor hallucis longus is on fibula so these are the various muscle attachments of the fibula now let's cover the last part of this session that is the articulated foot so articulated foot will be covering under these headings so for articulated foot headings are a bit different as compared to that of the other bones so which are the bones visible in articulated foot first of all there are groups this group is the tarsals this group is metatarsals and this group is phalanges in this the bones are viewed from the dorsal aspect and this the bones are viewed from the plantar aspect so which are the bones in the tarsal group this is talus this bone is calcaneus and just in front of the talus there is navicular in front of the calcaneus there is cuboid okay and then in front of the navicular there are three bones medial cuneiform intermediate cuneiform and lateral cuneiform okay. cuneiform means a wedge shaped bone navicular means a boat shaped bone okay then the metatarsals these are numbered from the great toe side this is the first metatarsal second third fourth and the fifth metatarsal and phalanges are 14 in number okay the fifth metatarsal has got a characteristic feature here we can see the projection from the fifth metatarsal it is referred to as the styloid process of the fifth metatarsal the cuboid bone has got a specific feature that is referred to as the groove of the cuboid bone this groove is for the fibularis longus muscle okay 
then navicular bone has got a specific feature that is referred to as the navicular tuberosity so we have covered various bones then joints formed by the articulated foot one joint is the ankle joint the talus articulates with the tibia and the fibula then below the talus whatever joints is, is there that is referred to as the subtalar joint okay and there is a specific component which is referred to as talo calcaneo navicular joint between talus navicular and the calcaneus this talo calcaneo navicular joint is a ball and socket variety of synovial joint the ball is formed by the head of the talus the socket is formed by the navicular bone as well as there is a ligament which connects navicular and the calcaneus then this intertarsal joints are plain variety of synovial joints then there are joints here in between the phalanges these are the hinge variety of synovial joints and for attachments of the articulated foot we need not remember all the intrinsic muscles uh, attachments we should be knowing the attachments of the extrinsic muscles okay what do we understand by extrinsic muscles the muscles of the leg which are coming and attached onto the foot those are the extrinsic muscles for example tibialis anterior you should know the attachment on the articulated foot it's on the base of the first metatarsal okay base of the first metatarsal medial aspect is tibialis anterior the lateral aspect is fibularis longus similarly other muscles also we should be knowing on the base of the fifth metatarsal the muscle is fibularis tertius then extensor digitorum longus will go up to the distal end of the uh, will go up to the distal phalanx on the dorsal aspect similarly flexor digitorum longus will come up to the distal phalanx of the plantar aspect the next sensor hallucis longus here flexor hallucis longus here then tibialis posterior has got characteristic attachment here we learned that is navicular tuberosity the primary attachment of tibialis posterior is on the navicular tuberosity then it sends out slips to all the tarsal bone except talus okay so talus is one bone which doesn't have any muscle attachments okay there is all other bones have got some of the other muscle attachments and then fifth metatarsal will also give attachment to the fibularis brevis muscle so that's how by uh, remembering the attachments of the extrinsic muscles we can remember various muscle attachments of the articulated foot then applied anatomy with respect to the articulated foot we can remember various applied anatomy with respect to the arches of the foot okay the club foot and all we can remember for the applied anatomy of the foot okay so read about the arches of the foot in detail for the applied anatomy so in this session i tried to cover all the bones of the lower limb just like i made revision videos for the upper limb and the revision video of the head and neck okay so if you all have not seen those sessions please go through from the i button above and for this session if you all have any doubts you can ask in the comments section below okay thank you